Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Mid Lakes 2020 Reopening Schools Virtual Community Forum to provide an update on the reopening of school and answer questions from, from families on the process of returning to school. This is the first of three forums this week with parents and community members. The others are set for 6 p.m. on August 19th and 10 a.m. Okay. on August 20th. The Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Mid Lakes 2020 Reopening okay. Schools virtual feedback. here. Um, the district has also held multiple meetings with teachers and staff in addition to town hall forums in July. We continue to accept questions from families submitted through the Mid Lake School Facebook page and to the reopening schools at midlakes.org email. I'm Todd Clausen, Public Relations Coordinator for the Phelps Clifton Springs Central School District, and I'll be the moderator for today. With me are Matt Sickles, Superintendent of Schools, Frank Bay Rossi, Principal of the Secondary School, Chris Moyer, Elementary School Principal, uh, Tammy Wood, Director on the Committee of Special Education, John Lombardi, Athletic Director and District Health and Safety Coordinator. We thank everyone, staff and families for participating in this forum. It is important for us to hear from you as it is for us to respond to your questions. With that, let's just jump right into it. Mr. Sickles, I'll start with you. Uh, the Board of Education last night approved several changes to the district calendar and had an opportunity to review the um, reopening school plans. Can you tell us about some of the changes to the calendar as it relates to the opening of school at the beginning of the year? Absolutely. Um, so we recognize um, that um, our reopening plan as per the guidance provided by the state um, Health Department and the State Education Department requires a lot of training of our staff uh, on new health and safety procedures, uh, not to mention different types of instruction. So we've made adjustments to the school calendar um, that allows us to turn the um, Tuesday through Friday, September 8th uh, through the 11th into staff only days, so that the first day of instruction for students will be Monday, September 14th. So that's regardless of whether they are in remote instruction or in a hybrid model. Um, the first day of instruction for students is the 14th. Um, the first day of work for staff is September 8th. But again, September 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th um, will be for staff only. That was accomplished by rearranging our superintendent's conference days and making a few other changes. Um, of note, December 23rd will be a day of uh, instruction and school attendance for students as will um, March, Friday, March 12th. So those are changes, but all of the changes to the calendar were made with the intent of freeing up that extra training and planning and preparation time for our staff um, so that we're truly ready um, to support the health, safety, and instruction of our students beginning on September. September 14th. Now, and on the September 14th date, we're going to have the plan is to bring students UPK through third grade on the campus in a hybrid model? Correct. Um, I think probably best if I, um, I know I, I presented a very lengthy, I think 30 slide presentation last night at the board meeting and that's viewable, um, I think on the school website and Facebook. Um, but if I could just share my screen for a moment, I'll just go through the first couple slides um, so that people are aware of the broad um, overview of our plan. So just so people understand um, the goals that have guided us and, and the entire administrative team and all the committees um, that have helped in this process, um, first and foremost, our plan is centered around protecting the health and safety of students and staff. Um, it's really important, I mean, for people to understand that we are dealing with a pandemic and the reopening of school is first and foremost um, a health and safety issue. Um, the, the, the next goal is to provide an equitable and high quality education for all of our students under circumstances that are both difficult and subject to change. 
Um, we have to comply with the guidance provided by the Department of Health, State Ed, and the CDC. Um, and it is our goal to return all grade levels and student populations to as much in-person instruction as possible as soon as safely possible. And yes, we are starting, and I'll get to in a little more detail in a minute, but we're starting with grades UPK 1, 2, and 3 in a hybrid model starting on um, September 14th. I'll explain what that hybrid model looks like. Um, but we are starting with those grade levels until we know how much capacity we have from a uh, time, space, and staffing perspective to bring more grade levels back. Um, a lot of people want to know what that timeline is, and we do not have a set timeline. We don't want to commit to a, a certain time frame because we want to do it when we know that we can safely do it. I'll explain that a little bit more in a, in a moment. Um, we know that we need to close achievement gaps in both reverse and prevent student regression. We understand that there was, there was a learning loss through the closure back in the spring and that we risk learning loss and regression through remote, you know, the, the disruption of the opening of school here um, in September through the combination of in-person and remote instruction. And we have to work hard um, and, and, and use new methods and new systems to close those achievement gaps and pre prevent that regression. Um, this next one is very important. Uh, and I think it's the theme for the entire reopening process is to, that we're taking a mindset of continuous improvement. We're doing work and asking our staff, our students, and our families to adapt to circumstances and to engage in practices that we've never had to do before. And we're doing our best to write those procedures and protocols um, in a thorough way and in a way that we think will work. But not until we start to do them on a daily basis will we know how well they work in practice. So. We expect a lot of adjustment. We expect to engage in honest self-reflection and evaluation, but also to take feedback from the community um, and be willing to adjust practices and improve them um, and make changes as needed. And then, and then finally, um, to provide transparency and communication to all stakeholders. And, and these town hall meetings are part of that. Um, we want to be very open with our community about what parts of our plan are firmed up and, and what parts are still in development. Um, I'll be honest, you know, right now, we're still working through a lot of the details. There, again, there are pieces that we'll get into that are complicated and take time, and, and we're still figuring out some of those protocols. Um, just an overview at this point, because of the state ed, in DOH guidance with six feet social distancing um, minimum. Um, it's just not possible for us to gauge in 100% in in-person instruction at this time. Um, many of our classrooms at six feet social distancing cap out at eight or 10 students per, per room. Some rooms at the secondary level may be a little bit more than that, uh, but not much more. So we, we have significant space constraints that are going to um, govern and limit um, how many students we can bring on campus at least to start. 100% remote instruction is available to all families um, and people have been communicating that to us. Um, we do ask for a minimum commitment of uh, at least one trimester or trimester at a time for K-6 and a quarter at a time for 712, just for planning and consistency purposes. Um, the hybrid model for those grade levels who are in the hybrid model, and we start with UPK through three, it's two days a week of in-person instruction and three days a week of remote instruction. So at every grade level, once they reach the hybrid model, there will be two groups per grade level. There will be a Monday, Tuesday group, who attend in person Monday and Tuesdays and are remote Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then there's a Thursday, Friday group who will be remote Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 
and in person Thursday and Friday. So we've had questions about, oh, are some grade levels these days and some grade levels other days? No, it's two groups within each grade level. We're going to start UPK through three, and then hopefully as we evaluate our, our new health and safety procedures and the availability and capacity of staff, we hope to be able to bring more grade levels back as quickly as possible. But that has to be based upon observation and data. Um, since we're not able to bring all um, students back at one time, the state guidance um, dictates that we prior, prioritize our most vulnerable populations for in-person instruction. So that is our youngest learners, which is why we're starting UPK three, our students with disabilities and our English language learners. And I'm sure we'll get to how um, those students will be served in person as we go through this, this meeting. Um, the cohorts are being formed now. It is a complicated process because we first had to identify the students um, who, whose parents were opting for 100% remote instruction, sort of take them out of the mix, rebalance class sizes and reassign students to classes, um, and then create the cohorts. And we're trying to create family consistency and balance bus loads as well. So um, the team is making progress and I'm sure they can get into a little bit more detail about that as we go. Um, but we're trying, we know that that's critical information for parents to have for childcare reasons. We apologize for the delay, but we want to send that information out when we know it's accurate so that we're not changing it later after people have already made um, arrangements. Okay, so again, there's the UPK through three. We've received a lot of questions about why are, why are we, unlike any other districts, not able to bring more students on campus to start the year. And I can only speak to our district. Um, I, I'm not responsible, nor do I have the, the necessary knowledge of the resources and constraints of other districts. Um, but I know what our space constraints are and our staffing capacity is. And we have collectively and with board support made the decision to um, try to perfect our practices and do things very really well with a smaller number of grade levels and then incrementally bring more grades back when it's safe to do so. Um, so grades four through 12 will start in 100% remote instruction and we'll do our best to add grade levels as we can. Um, there will be some special education students and we can get into this in more detail as we go, who will have in-person instruction regardless of their grade level, um, and then related services um, for you know, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech language counseling will um, be provided through a combination of remote and in-person delivery. Um, our English language learners will have additional in-person instruction according to their needs. Um, we'll speak to that. Um, at this time, and I know this has caused a lot of confusion, but it is an area of great concern. At this time, no interscholastic sports are allowed in New York. That's not our decision. That, that's a state decision. So we await um, any changes to that and we'll adapt accordingly. Um, but the New York State Public High School Athletic Association um, will be the overall governing body um, that'll make decisions um, if and when. Um, the governor allows the resumption of sports. Decisions about extracurricular clubs and activities are being evaluated now. There will be extracurricular clubs. We're just trying to determine which ones can be adequately provided in the hybrid and remote models. Um, as I referenced earlier, our reopening plan will undergo constant evaluation and updates. We want to make sure that we're um, making our operations efficient and that we're getting good student outcomes. So we'll be collecting data from parents, students, and staff, and our own observations, and everyone must be prepared for, for changes and, and improvements in the plan as we go. And then finally, as the governor made very clear um, right up front, all grade levels must be prepared to move to 100% remote instruction at any given time based upon changing circumstances. And that those might be statewide circumstances, uh, uh, governor's executive orders, or it could be based upon local circumstances. So um, 
we need to be flexible throughout this process. So I'm gonna stop there. This entire PowerPoint and the other 25 plus slides are up on the website, I believe. Um, yep. But I thought I'd at least give that overview and, and certainly follow up. If yeah, so for those who are on the live stream, if you go to midlakes.org, there's a tab reopening midlakes. And if you go to the overview section, you'll find um, the superintendent's full PowerPoint presentation that he gave last night to the Board of Education, meaning that outlines those um, points on there. Um, but Matt, before I go to um, Frank, I, I want to underscore a couple things because we've already got a couple questions on the live stream, and I think he addressed it, but I just kind of want to make crystal clear. Sure. The, the limited amount of population, you know, the UPK through third graders that are coming on campus, I mean, it's really guided by what we received from the state, the Department of Health Edu and the space constraints. And, and right. So, yeah, the, actually, the next slide that I didn't go to was the constraint slide, which the things that hold us back are space, time and staffing. Um, the space is primarily related to the social distancing. So a standard classroom, the way our classrooms are built, um, range generally from eight to 10 kids can fit at six feet apart. Some of our you know, secondary classrooms, maybe as many as 12 or 13, but it's at the secondary level, we also have you know, classes where maybe there might be one section of a class and the class size is 26 to 30. So 12 doesn't even get us there. So, you know, we have to work through those processes and in that process of making rooms available and, and teachers may be teaching in different rooms than they're accustomed to teaching because we might need to move them from a room that only fits eight kids to a different space in the building that can accommodate 10, 12, or 13 as we go. So this is truly a work in progress um, from a space standpoint. Um, time, there are numerous health and safety protocols that have to be implemented, um, ranging from health screenings to social distancing as we load and unload buses, um, and how we feed kids and how we clean spaces during the day. All of those things eat up time. And until we know how much time they take and how much of our staffing it takes to accomplish those tasks, we don't know how many more grade levels we can support. If everybody's cooperating and things are going very smoothly, we may find that we have the time and the staffing to bring more grade levels on and perform the necessary health and safety procedures. But we're not going to do that until we can ensure the health and safety. Do if, and I'm going to press you a little bit on that, because one of the questions already asked is about, and, and there's been others to the email as well, time frame for bringing more kids on campus. And right. um, I know there's no decisions really on that. But things go well, do you, do you try to bring them on in a couple weeks, a couple months? What? Yeah, I mean, it is, as soon as safely possible. I, I, I'm reluctant to say any specific time frame out of fear that people will count on that and then make plans, um, childcare plans based on, well, Mr. Sickles said on August 18th that it was gonna be every, X days or weeks. Um, we're, listen, we understand that we have an obligation to this community to both educate, but care for our students during the day. We know the many different ways that our community, community relies upon us. And this is disappointing to all of us that we cannot start with all of our students here on campus two days a week, let alone every day, which is what we would prefer. Um, so we're going to work as hard as we can and as quickly as we can to add grade levels. 
but health and safety and compliance with the guidance is what's going to drive that pacing. Um, I hope it's soon, sooner rather than later, um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back and not identify a specific time frame because I don't want people to misinterpret or rely upon that. Um, all I can do is promise that we will do it as quickly and as safely as we can. Okay. Um, I'm going to go over to Mr. Bay Rossi at, at the secondary school for, for a couple questions. Um, Mr. Sickles talked a little bit about the September 14th start date for all students, but because um, I know we've received a lot of email questions on this one, the CTE students at the high school, um, they're going to start a little earlier. Can you tell us a little bit about what so our, our CTE students that, that go to the BOCES program um, will be starting on September 9th. Uh, they're, you know, the BOCES program is in a little bit different situation. They have a much larger facility. Um, their rooms are much larger and they can uh, have kids in their room. So they're going to have 100% of the kids on campus every day. Um, so we will be busing any of our, our CTE students that need busing um, will will be bused to that program daily. Um, one of the things that BOCES has also done this year is they're allowing any, usually they don't allow students to drive there uh, because of parking. They're going to allow students to drive themselves there if they have their own transportation. Um, but as a district, we will be supporting that and transporting any students that do need transportation to that program. And they're, they're starting on the 9th, correct? On the 9th, yep. Yeah, and is the the hours of operation at the tech center that that's consistent with what it's been in previous years right if you right yes they have a morning program and an afternoon program great great and that stays the same okay and and staying with you i know um you've done a lot of work in terms of the school schedule uh, developing a block schedule can you tell us a little bit about how that works the the there, there's some times in there and um what you know what what families yep. can expect so so one of the, the mandates or, or pieces of the guidance that the state gave us was to try to reduce the number of transitions uh, for students in the building during the day. Um, you know, during our normal operation, during our eight period day, students may transition eight, nine, ten times. Um, and and we really need to limit that so that, that kids are staying socially distanced. They're not all in the hallway at the same time. So by switching to a block schedule, we're changing those transitions from eight, nine or ten to five or six at, at most. Um, so the block schedule, we're taking our old eight period schedule and running those classes as blocks. So if, if you look at a Monday, Tuesday, um, on Monday, our, our students, when they get their schedules, they will have their first and second period class. So first block would be their first period class. Second block would be their second period class. Then the third block would be their fifth period class. And the fourth block would be their sixth period class. That would be Monday. Then Tuesday, they do the, the same block, one, two, three, four, but now they finish up that eight period schedule. So then it's going to be their period four class or their period three class, their period four class, their period seven class, and their period eight class. Now those classes are all 88 minutes long. Um, so it's, it's a much longer time frame that, that the teachers have to, to provide instruction. Um, and again, fewer transitions. The third block during that block schedule is our, our lunch time. Um, we will have three separate lunch times uh, for kids, our A, B, and C um, lunches. But because it's a block, it's all now one period. In our eight, eight, in our eight period schedule, it's, it's broken up differently in this block schedule. So um, students will have one of three ways to get to lunch. They will either go to lunch during A block or A, a lunch, which would be at the beginning of that, that third block. They'd be in lunch for 30 minutes and then go to class for the remainder of that block or they would go to class um, for 40 minutes, then go to lunch for 30 minutes, then go back to class for another 46 minutes. Or if they go to class for 88 minutes, then they go to lunch for 30 minutes. That's how we're breaking up the, the three lunches during that time frame. Okay, and the school day is pretty much the same. I'm sorry, Matt, that, as, as it has been in terms of oh, when the day starts and when the day ends, it's pretty consistent yeah. with last. 7.30 to 2.14. Yeah, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to point out, and, and everything that Frank just described, that is when grades 7 and 12 come back on campus into the hybrid model, um, which I just want, I, I want to reiterate the point that we do have a plan for 7th through 12th grade coming back into the hybrid model. I know there's grave concern out there that because of how we're starting that 
seven through 12 is never gonna make it on campus. That is not our intention. And we wouldn't have this schedule and this plan that Frank just described if we didn't intend to get grade seven through 12 back on campus as soon as we possibly can. Well, and if I can say one other thing, Todd, about, about that schedule, because people may ask, why have you split up the periods the way we did? And why didn't you just do one through four one day and five through eight the next day? That was really to accommodate our CTE students um, that are going to the BOCES program so that they're not missing classes. That's why the, the breakup is the way it is. Great, great. Um, we also want to get into a little bit about back to school things as it relates to the secondary school. So supply lists, you know, kind of summer mail, things that we would hear. Or summer about. mailings, yeah, that's, you know, I'm sure one of the things that parents are really looking for and students are really looking for is the summer mailings because that usually includes their schedule. It includes, you know, supply lists and includes all that information. Um, you know, a big part of, of our planning process is the scheduling process. You know, switching from that eight period schedule to a block schedule is not something that happens overnight. It's not like you flick a switch and you can just switch it over. Um, we also have to make sure that we're balancing the classes so that we can accommodate all the kids in our classrooms. So we're working through that process. We're hoping to, to have that done. Everything else for the mailing is ready. You know, as we get things ready, the, the secretaries have put, been putting things into the mailings. Um, we're just waiting for the final last touches so that we can send it out. And we're hoping to do that very soon. Great. And, you know, one thing that I've, I've seen a lot, too, is as you and Mr. Moyer and, and, and there's other committees, district committees that are focused on different aspects of the reopening plan. Um, you, you know, the administrative team has certainly been a part of it, but there's been a lot of support from the teachers as well and the staff and, and just you know, volunteering, stepping forward, doing whatever they can um, uh, on that. I mean, it, 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 maybe you can speak a little bit about how the, what the staff is thinking. And, and, and I would say that, you know, I, I've always had great admiration for our staff. Our staff is very invested in, in the success of our students. Um, you know, you always hear us talk about Mid Lakes is, is a family. Um, and, and, you know, you see that on a daily basis in our buildings. Um, the effort that the, the teachers and staff uh, put into to our student and their education. You know, it's, it's been amazing to watch the teachers um, give up their time, you know, because they're on their summer break, you know, but there's, I can't tell you how many have, have been sitting on committees for months now um, and meeting for hours and hours to, to put these plans into place and help us develop these plans. They're very invested in making sure that, that this is successful. Um, you know, you know, you, I think in one of the last meetings we talked about teachers and, and you know, this is different for them as well. Um, you know, they were trained to teach with students in front of them in a classroom. They weren't trained to, to teach, you know, virtually, um, but they're invested in making sure they can do that. And they're invested in making sure they can do that in, in a positive way. Good. Very good. One other question and Matt, you can chime in and, and Chris will be getting to you in a, in a second, but because um, there's been a couple questions about remote learning. Um, any, so, so for those students that are going to, well, I, I mean, everybody's going to have a little bit of it, even if you're, you're coming onto campus, but for the secondary level, what can you, any light can you shed on, on what remote learning instruction will look like? Well, and, and you know, I would say it's going to look, it depends on the teacher's classroom that you're talking about. You know, it could look in, it could look, uh, in many different ways. Um, teachers, you know, have the, the ability to, to adapt their lessons. So, you know, it could be that they meet with the kids on Zoom for 20, 30, 40 minutes during that 80 minute block, give them some, you know, face-to-face -face or in-person instruction, and then give them a task to do. Um, we've purchased license, Zoom licenses for all our teachers, so they have the ability to do breakout sessions with kids in there. There's uh, whiteboards that they can use to draw on and have the kids see. Um, you know, it may be some teachers may do flipped classrooms where they videotape themselves and then post that and the, the homework is for the kids to watch that lesson. And then when they, they meet with them on Zoom, that's where they do the work. You know, they, the teachers help the kids do that work. You know, the, our goal and our, our expectation <clears throat> is that both teachers and students are following that black schedule, even when they're 100% remote, so that if you have a 730 class, you're going to meet with that teacher at 730. So there's consistency. Um, to the schedule for kids. Um, but the way that the teachers do that in the classroom is going to be up to them. But we, one of the things, one of the committees that we're on right now is, is we're talking about that and we're building um, kind of like what I call a, a goodie bag for teachers of different ways that they can, can 
operate in their classroom in a virtual setting so that they have some ideas. And we have teachers on that committee, administrators on that committee, all putting their heads together to try to get that done. Yeah, best, best practices, sharing what works, it seems, seems like the way to go. Um, well, if I could just speak to that from a broader perspective for a second, you know, I, I want to just acknowledge up front that we, we made certain decisions about remote instruction back in the spring based upon the circumstances of the time. And as many districts did, we, we took a very flexible approach. Um, it was a, a traumatic, sudden change for everybody. And we were adapting as we went and we made the decision to, to have a very, a, more of a hands-off approach. Um, while that worked in some ways and for some students, the feedback from students, parents, and staff has been universally that we need more structure and consistency. So remote learning, whether it's 100% remote or the three-day remote in the hybrid model, it is going to look different. It is going to be more structured. Frank talked about the schedules being consistent so that the student will follow that schedule, whether they're in-person or remote. Um, students who are in the hybrid model will have the opportunity to follow along with what's going on with the in-person students through technology. Now we're working out the details of that, but that's the model. We're looking to offer recorded instruction, recordings of live instruction whenever possible for two reasons. One, so that students and families can go back for reinforcement, but also there may be situations that may interfere with a student's ability to engage live due to illness or due to other family circumstances. So we want to provide predictability and consistency, but flexibility at the same, at the same time. Frank talked about that, that bag of tricks. We're helping teachers to develop that bag of tricks, but we don't want that bag of tricks to be so full that it's too much for families and students to navigate. So we want to find a, a lane so that there's a handful of methods that teachers are using so that a parent isn't trying to support, you know, that was one thing last year is we had gave teachers quite a bit of latitude and flexibility and that put pressure on families to support many different models and platforms. So we're, we're leaning into Seesaw as the learning platform for K-6 and Schoology is the learning platform for 712 and trying to streamline different apps and on online tools so that everybody, students, staff, and families can get good at a few things rather than being pulled in many different directions. And I'm sure both principals can elaborate on that, but I wanted to put that in a broader context and acknowledge we know we need to do better, we need to do it differently and better, and that's going to be incremental. You know, I, I don't want to make promises that we're going to, you know, have perfect whatever that is remote instruction on day one. You know, it's going to continue to be a learning process and we're, we're committed to doing better every day than the day before. Okay. Um, I kind of want to move to Mr. Moyer, the elementary school principal. Um, we, we, we talked to Frank about what's going on, the schedules at the high school or the secondary school. Let, let's go into a little bit about the elementary school and um, what, what you're working on and what, what things might look like for the, the first students that arrive on campus? Well, for students that arrive on campus, we're, we're talking about our kinder UPK through third graders. Um, what we've done is we've made, we've revised our schedule so it works whether students are in person or remote. So the students are going to be able to um, follow the same schedule whether they're here, um, on the, and they're gonna be, if the students are here two days, that schedule will continue. So we're going to be um, approaching it from the standpoint of skills. Um, uh, instead of looking at it as daily lessons, which it always boils down to daily lessons, but our teachers are taking the lens that we're looking at the, the instructional week. These are the um, standards, the skills that we want to focus on this week. These are the methods we're going to use to get to teaching those skills. And I've heard Matt say a number of times the statement, we might not cover as much material, but we're going to be driven by the state standards and skills-driven instruction. 
So students that are not on site will be able to learn right along with the students that are sitting in the classroom. So we're going to have that consistent um, growth every day. Because if we don't do that, as again, as was mentioned earlier, you know, we know there's gaps that were created for March through June. Um, we don't want to keep expanding those gaps. We have to find ways to to pick up the pace. And I, the word that I haven't heard yet that I think is incredibly important is accountability. There, there has to be accountability for the learning that's going on. Um, we need to have our teachers working more closely with our students, holding them accountable for learning. As administrators, we need to be working more closely with our teachers to make sure that that this is happening on a daily basis. Um, I know one committee that you're involved in has been doing a lot of work and that's the, the like a rival dismissal committee. You know, everybody's coming on um, and, and I know plans aren't finalized on that, but um, is there is there something that we can, you know, I, I know rooms are being moved around, the nurse's office has kind of changed just, just to, you know, th there's so many changes going on and, and I know people are worried about, you know, my family, how it's going to impact, but when they get to school, school will be, look a little different. Yeah, the school is going to look a little different, but we'll, we'll take the two separate things you talked about, arrival, dismissal. Yeah. Um, you know, you saw, I started to laugh. I saw other people on the screen kind of crack a smile because it, it, it's really, you stop and I, you know, leading that, I'm leading that charge for the elementary building because we have to get our kids into the building safely. You know, once we get them through our doors, off the buses, away, you know, anybody that's pulled into our parking lot on a regular school day knows it can be a tremendously um, frustrating situation and you have to be patient in the parking lot. So we're putting a lot of focus on creating um, protocols to make the flow of traffic run more smoothly. We spent quite a bit of time this morning, as a matter of fact, just talking about arrival procedures, um, having a nice size committee, talking about how we're gonna make this work smoothly, how we're going to assign staff. Um, it will look different, but at the same time, we're gonna to stick to cl as close to our normal arrival and dismissal times as we possibly can. Um, there will have to be, it's going to be a little bit longer process because we're going to have to meet children at the parents' cars, walk them into the building through the, through the entrance ways that are designated as our entrance ways for the different, for the buses and the, the parents. But we're very close. And I know uh, Mr. Bay Rossi alluded to the fact we have our summer mailings ready to go, except for some of those very small, those very small, but very important details. We've had to rebalance class lists. We've had to make the A and B cohorts. Um, that information is not complete yet. So as soon as that information's in there, we'll have it out. Our bus tags, we will be providing bus tags for every student kindergarten to third grade this year to help with that arrival process for getting students moving in the right directions. Um, we're co color coding our signage around the building um, through the help of staff members to, to make it easier for the flow of traffic and to have lots of staff on hand pointing children in the right directions. Um, and they were very, I mean, after today, I actually was, I'm going to use the word giddy. I don't know if I've ever been giddy in my life, <laughs> but uh, I felt, I felt incredibly happy at the end of the arrival dismissal meeting today from the, the, the discussion that took place, how far we got into the nuts and bolts today with times and with procedures and attacking um, the dismissal process on Wednesday at our next meeting and having all that ready to go. I mean, we're right there on the cusp of having all that in order. Now, the building itself, yes, it, it looks a bit different. We've had to move some classrooms. We moved our office. When you enter the elementary school building down through the main foyer, um, all elementary offices are now on your right-hand side as you enter. What was last year's PSO is now the elementary's main office and the PSO is connected to us. So we are contained now between the main entrance and door A of the building and the MEC program now will enter through the main foyer, which never was the case and created some real concerns because we had multiple entrances to our building being used. The MEC office now is on the left-hand side of the foyer, going from the foyer all the way to door one and we've, in the process of doing that, move both our nurses um, together to a large space next to the cafeteria 
where we will have all of our nursing staff at one location. Um, students won't have to guess which nurse's office to go to. Um, they will be covering each other and working together, um, which brings that Mid Lakes Elementary School process even closer to joining everything in, into one cohesive unit. Um, and other changes around the building, you know, are just some classroom changes that we've had to make that students can will probably be able to figure out quickly when they get here. Okay. Um, so in the classroom, you know, you might have seven, eight, however many st student desks will be there, you know, in, in a regular classroom. But can you take something like either specials, you know, music or, or you know, and just how how it's coming together what it what it might look like because i know particularly with like the the music kids there's there's something a little bit different there it, well with music i mean in particular music and pe and i'll let mr lombardi talk to to the the pe um but music you and PE, we have to have the students 12 feet apart if they're without masks and they're singing because it it spreads the um the moisture from the the respiratory system even further when they're singing or they are breathing heavily. So as of right now, the way we have it set up, our specials teachers, our art, our music, um, and library for the short term will be moving to classrooms. Um, it reduces our number of transitions. It reduces the number of spaces that our custodial staff will have to clean in quick turnaround fashion. So the students will have their own area. The specials teachers will, will go to those areas. From that point, we're encouraging the use of the outdoors, weather permitting, um, getting kids outside. This this district, um, Mike, Mr. Reefstack gave me the, the number, but we the amount of green space that we have in this district is astronomical, and we should utilize it while we can, um, because we know our weather won't stay nice forever. Um, but the specials are going to look a little different. Um, like I said, we're encouraging them to go outside. Um, and I'll let Mr. Lombardi, if he'd like to, you know, speak to the, the PE and the ideas around PE. As far as PE goes, we, we're going to, again, try to get outside as much as we possible, possibly can when the weather's nice. And we may even have to think about, you know, there are winter sports and winter games that we can, you know, be creative with and think of how to incorporate that into phys ed as well. Um, but we also, if we're in the classroom and we can't get outside, we might have to focus more on the mindfulness piece as far as the yoga and mental health aspect of physical education and stuff like that. And some of it might be tasked to as homework assignments or things that you can do with your family as well outside of the classroom, but at home that they can do outside where they're still 12 feet apart or they're maintaining that proper distance to make sure that we keep everybody safe and things like that. So. Great, thanks, John, and and thanks, Chris. There, there's a question that came up, and it, and it sort of generally speaks a little bit about flexibility. Um, and I know that uh, in terms of the surveys that, the, and Matt, I'm kind of looking at you on my screen right now. Okay. Surveys that we we we've sent, the district has sent out to families to fill out. You know, what what are your preferences for transportation, multiple children, or um, even you know your your preference for remote learning to start off the school year uh, the, the you know there's been some some flexibility on some of those um and the question here is kind of relating a little bit more to transportation plans um going forward it, you know can you speak a little bit about how some of these may or some of these things that we're talking about may or may not be flexible in terms of when i lock in a schedule or when a form might be due. Right, so as much information as people can provide us as quickly as possible is helpful, but we also know that it's a give and take and they're waiting on us for some things too. And there's this constant chicken and egg battle back and forth and we, we understand that. Um, I would say, you know, with transportation, if, if their transportation needs depend upon the day, then I would tell them to put down that they need bus transportation. It's easier for us to take them out of a bus later than it is to fit them onto a bus after that bus has been set up for maximum capacity. So if you don't know, I would err on the side of saying you need bus transportation. Okay? And I know the transportation department is, is 
you know, sending out information and, and is open to phone calls and emails as well. Um, but again, we're, you know, our buses, we can fit one student per seat with everybody wearing a mask. If there's a student who's medically exempt from wearing a mask, then they have to be six feet apart and that will limit capacity. So we max out at about 22 students on a 65 passenger bus, which is most of our buses and 27 kids on an 81 passenger bus, we have two of those. So we need to maximize our capacity and balance those loads. So it, it's better to start with more kids and take a kid off than try to find a spot later to fit a kid on. We'll do our best. Um, you know, similarly with remote instruction, um, we're asking, you know, people to, you know, commit a quarter at a time at the secondary level, although everybody's starting remote um, to begin with, um, and a trimester at a time at the K-6 level for planning and consistency, because then we know how many students to balance out across classes at a grade level to, to fit within our max capacity in the classrooms. And it's easier um, to take a student out of an in-person classroom than it is to add a student back. And as we go through and, and we get to that quarter break and that trimester break, if students, parents do wanna bring their students back, that's still gonna be dependent upon space. And we may have to, we're gonna make every effort to accommodate those, but then we may be looking at switching our room usage around and using larger, um, larger non-traditional classroom spaces if need be, if we need to fit some more kids. So um, it, it's, it's easier um, to take a student out of in-person instruction than it is to add them back in. Gotcha. That makes sense. I think so. And you know, um, since we're talking about forms and deadlines and flexibility, um, I know one form that's out there, I think it was a being mailed home to everybody, but it's also posted on our website under our food service tab is the, the free and reduced application form, right. which is something obviously important under, under these situations. Right, so our food service um, setup is gonna be a little different in the um, starting in September than it was in the spring and the summer. Um, back in the spring, um, given, again, the suddenness of the situation as per executive orders um, and guidance from the state is we were authorized to provide free meals to all students. Um, and, and we were reimbursed accordingly. Um, and as a result, we were, we were feeding 800 to 875 students daily. Um, through the reopening guidance, we must provide meals, make them available to all students, whether they're in person or remote. However, we will not, we're, we're not allowed to offer free meals to everybody. Meals will be offered at the normal meal prices, okay? Um, students will not be denied a meal based on inability to pay. We'll, we'll navigate those circumstances as we normally would, but the basic, expectation is that um, families will prepay if, if they need their students to access meals. All meals will be in brown bag form, whether they're in person or remote, um, just for health and safety reasons to avoid serving lines um, and open plates. Um, the remote learning um, meal option will start at least through a pickup system twice a week with multiple days worth of meals offered um, at each pickup time that week. Um, but you asked about the free and reduced um, lunch form. That is being made available to everybody um, so that we get a comprehensive list of, of students and families who qualify for that benefit. Um, we want as many families who qualify to get that benefit as possible. So when in doubt, fill out the form because then that'll allow us to offer free and reduced priced meals to more families. 
Um, but if you don't qualify, the meals will be available through prepayment at the normal meal prices. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, Tammy, I'd like to come to you now. Sorry to make you wait for so long to get a couple of questions in. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the, the scheduling? You know, we kind of went over it with Frank and Chris a little bit, but how, you know, how it applies to, to those um, students in, in this, you know, special education umbrella. So the students who are part of the 1211 or the 151 special classes, um, they'll be on campus uh, Monday, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, and they'll follow each building's block schedule. The students who um, are in the consultant teacher direct or our co-top programs or our resource programs, um, we are looking for additional in-person instruction time for them. So what's going to happen there? I, the CSE office, will be in touch with the staff. That includes the special ed teachers, the related service staff. That could include OT, PT, speech, social workers, counselors. You know, we're all getting together to communicate with the parents to say how how did that remote learning go in the spring, and is there a time that we can bring your child on campus um, per parent request for some instruction by the special education staff. So we will be busy with that. I have done many phone calls and emails with interested parents already, and we'll continue to work through that. Um, we will have a finalized schedule to parents on those pieces um, hopefully by the 4th of September, we're hoping in the next couple of weeks to, to break out um, how that will be offered individually for each student. All right, so it sounds like it's really important, I mean, kind of underscore, I think Matt was mentioning it in terms of communication, contact, reaching out. Mm -hmm. Families really should start reaching out to you as soon as possible. And, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure this goes with anybody on the panel. If someone has a question, just reach out directly. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I know we got the reopening schools email that's been looked at daily. People right. are responding to it, but um, direct emails, phone calls, you know, we're all in this kind of together and we want to work on it together. And I, I know all you, you guys, have, the administrative team, the teachers, you guys have been working tremendously hard on everything. And I can, I can see it, you know, the, the calendar meeting committee dates and everything is just full with, with things going on. So, um, and certainly if the principals, if they communicate with the principals, it will get to me. We okay. work very closely every day. So if parents can't get a hold of me, they can certainly get a hold of the principal and we'll get the same message. Okay. I want to kind of go back a little bit. Um, John Lombardi, we're, we're talking a little bit about PE classes before things kind of going on outside um, for the students. Um, is there any other parts of campus that have started to open up to the community or is there a time frame for that yet? Well, we've opened up like the track and the tennis courts have recently been opened up, but it's you know to kind of, they still have to follow the social distancing guidelines and you know, it's making sure that that's outside, they're spaced apart. There can't be any congregation or anything along those lines. It's just very light things like that to kind of let the community back in. They've used like the track just to get a little bit of exercise or fresh air or, or the tennis courts. But that's really, that's even that is really all that's been okay really to do by the governor's office and things like that as far as when it comes to things on campus. Nothing, yeah. no competitive sports or anything along those lines, anything that would require a lot of people together. So that's kind um, of what with that. No, no, th thanks for that. Um, you know, while we all know you as our lovable AD on campus, you're also starting to wear another hat through the whole process, the, the health and safety coordinator role. You've been working a lot with Department of Public Health on, on a lot of different things. Um, can you go over briefly some, some, some general safety protocols and, and um, some things that maybe, you know, parents can help their, their children with or, the older students should be aware of? 
Yeah, so a lot of it is that there was a 145, 48 page document sent out by the Department of Health and um, the New York State Department of Education that we're kind of have to go through. And a lot of it, a big section of that is health and safety. So that's where the, you know, six feet apart in the classroom with the desk come in, uh, making sure that we're sanitizing more regularly on a frequent basis, any type of high traffic areas, we're making sure that we have a protocol in place that we're cleaning those areas. Um, and then, you know, the face coverings that students will need to wear, you know, making sure that, you know, we're using our proper hand washing techniques and making sure that we're all nice and clean before that, our hand sanitizer, even before you put your mask on or take your mask off. And then I know the younger kids, there's a lot been a lot of questions about how do we get our kids used to wearing masks and what can we do to make sure that they are comfortable wearing those masks. So it's going to be important that you just make sure that you find a mask that feels comfortable for your, your child, you know, practice that before they come into school. Um, the younger kids, it might be something as far as just talking to your kid about your student about what it's going to be like in school with a mask on, maybe draw a mask on your favorite superhero or, practice at home putting a mask on a stuffed animal so that they're used to seeing that kind of thing. Um, it could be something is personalizing your own mask. I know a lot of people when they graduate, they personalize their own caps at graduation. So maybe it's something that they can personalize their own mask and make it their own, and make it a little more interesting. Um, but again, we're going to have um, mask breaks for students so that we understand that it's going to be tough for them to kind of get used to. So there's going to be opportunities for them to take their masks off and have a break. And again, we're just making sure that they're spaced apart. And our top priority is the making sure that our students are safe, our staff is safe, and that we're make sure that we can get kids back on campus and get, get them back learning, but at the same time that we're doing it safely so that everybody is protected. There was, um, and, and I, I'm not gonna take credit for this, so we gotta give credit to uh, Assistant Principal Jim Giancursio. He mentioned that um, his kids, whenever they watch TV or play video games, they get to wear the mask. <laughs> so I, I thought that was was an interesting, just to kind of get get used to the feel, get used to having having that covering on, um, because it's, it's not something that, you know, we're, we're typically um, used to. And, um, and, Matt, I got a couple follow-up questions um, for you. Uh, before we get to the ENL students, um, but tying into the health and safety, last night there was, uh, you know, an announcement at the, at the Board of Education meeting, the Mid Lakes PTO, and can you tell us, us a little bit about their their sizable donation to the district? Yeah, absolutely. So, one of the health and safety uh, protocol requirements. Um, is the expectation that families take temperatures of their students and, and fill out um, a health questionnaire, which will be done online and we're still working on that tool, but to take the temperature of each of their children before they get on the bus or before they report to school every day. We'll have backup procedures um, here at school um, to ensure temperature taking and, and to help with parents and families that aren't it, on that aren't able to do that. However, the PTO has made a generous donation of nearly uh, $1,400 to purchase um, a supply of thermometers that will be available for distribution to families who may not have one of their own. Uh, we want to equip families um, to be able to take the temperatures um, of their children before they come to school. And we're incredibly grateful to the PTO um, and their generosity in, in, in helping us. Um, you know, in previous town halls, I, I've made the point that this, what we're about to embark upon, you know, it, it's a huge lift. It's very different for everybody, but it has to be a collaborative effort. I think even you have said, you know, we're all in this together. We, we need to work together and we need our families to do their part in the home. We need our students to, to cooperate at school. And that, it's those things that's going to get more kids on campus sooner. Um, because if, if families are helping us by performing those temperature checks and filling out those health questionnaires, that's going to lighten the lift here at school. If students are, are getting used to wearing their masks and are complying with that, that frees up time and resources and staffing um, that would otherwise be used in, in 
dealing with those students. So the more everybody's working together and cooperating and following all these procedures, the better, and it'll, it'll add to health and safety and get more students on campus. But yeah, uh, just a huge, huge shout out. The PTO has been so supportive, even going back to the spring and supporting um, recognition of our seniors and, and, and now helping um, to support the health and safety of our students as we return. Um, we're incredibly grateful for their support and I'll put in a plug for them because they're always looking for more membership. So parents, you know, if you're not already a member of the PTO, if you're not attending their meetings and, and right now they're doing them um, through Zoom or virtual means, you know, um, please consider becoming an active participant in the PTO because they really play an important role. I know um, you can find them on Facebook. Go ahead, Chris. Can we also put in the, the recognition to our Rotary um, along yeah, with that? Please? Um, I'll let you do it if you'd like to. Oh, go ahead, Chris. You, you've had firsthand interactions. I think it's important while we're pointing out, you know, what um, our PTO has done. It's also important to point out Rotary. Um, Mr. Bayrasi and I have been working with Rotary and um, our secretaries, Mrs. Borgian in particular, has been working closely with Rotary through, with me. Um, they are going to be donating pretty much all of the necessary supplies this year. Um, we, we worked with them, changed our processes, and they're donating to us all the kinds of supplies that every student um, could use. We're currently working on uh, putting that stuff together, so a plan to distribute um, to the community. Is, you know, it's easy for the students that are going to be here, but the majority will not be, so we're working on a process. But I, it's important to recognize their incredible generosity and and the amount and time and effort that Rotary has put into providing us with those materials. We definitely, we definitely are more successful when more people are involved, when families take an active role, when teachers are, you know, everybody's working and thinking about students being number one, definitely. We, so we talked about schedules at, at the secondary school, the elementary school for special ed education mm -hmm. students. Um, Matt, per, perhaps um, you could talk a little bit about the schedule, the, 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 the efforts to focus on the ENL students. Yeah, so as I referenced up front, um, as per the guidance, you know, if we're not able to bring all students on campus for in-person instruction um, to begin with, um, the guidance calls for us to prioritize what they group together as our most vulnerable population. So our youngest students, our students with disabilities and our English language learners. So we've talked about how special education students will receive um, some additional in-person instruction. Tammy talked about how to you know, reach out to her office to talk about that. Um, but our English language learners, those who are not already incorporated into the UPK through three hybrid model or the 12-1-1 and 15-1-1 special classes um, will otherwise um, receive at least two days a week of in-person instruction. We're working out those schedules, um, but we will get those students on campus to work with their ENL teachers for additional support and, and immersion um, in the language um, to, to aid in their transition and growth in that area. Great. Um, there was another question that came up as you were talking and, um, and you know, now we're, we're, we're a little bit past an hour, so I want to be respectful of everybody's time, but um, question about for the counselors and how will they work with students that are at home, you know, now, now that they're not at school, any, any, for, for anybody on our panel, any clarity around that, or I see John raising his hand. I, I can talk, I can speak to that too because I, I meet with the, the counselors on a regular basis and John you can add to it. Um, you know our, our counseling team is very invested in, in reaching out to students. I mean that that's why they're here. They will be able to you know they can use phone. Uh, the counselors will have access to, zo to Zoom if they want to do counseling sessions one on one with kids. Um, I know one of the questions that has come up a lot as well as for our seniors in the college process, the counselors are heavily involved in that and the counselors will be available to any of our seniors and their families as well um, to help with that process, whether it be through the phone or Zoom or email. Okay. 
Anything else, John, or anybody else? Uh, along with it, I mean, it, the good thing is this year we were actually in the process of kicking off a pretty big um, project as far as really focusing on the social emotional well being of students. Um, we were bringing in different um, things that we could do, and we've already had a subcommittee started. So a lot of the counselors have been involved with that subcommittee, and our psychologists as well have been involved in that subcommittee, getting stuff together to roll out this coming year. So it's the one good thing and the silver lining in some of this is we've already we're already putting that work in so we'll be there to support our kids as the school year opens up great great um i'll, I'll leave this this one open up a ge general question um you know i've asked i've asked each of you this one before sort of a wrap up um any advice for families uh that are kind of going through this process and and um you know may have questions or just aren't sure about things or you know you, you guys are kind of like the experts in the field chris i see you nodding your head i don't know if that means you want to respond first but i'll kick it to you i'll kick it to you first you know if if i understand what you're asking you know advice through this difficult time for our families yeah. the, the number one piece of advice i can give is don't don't think you have a question that that i that doesn't make sense don't think you if you have a question something's bothering you you just you're advocating for your child and and that is what your job is in, in this situation our job is to answer your questions to the best of our ability and sometimes you might get an answer well we're working on it and that's frustrating but don't stop that that flow of communication you'll reach out to us um email a lot of um people know that, that instead of an email back they get a phone call instead um, or we ask for when a good time is, but don't stop that and, and never stop that. Um, and don't, I have had people contact me and say, well, I wanted to ask this before, um, but I felt like it wasn't a good question. There, there's no question and there's nothing out of bounds right now um, for, for families to call, to contact us and ask us. Yeah, and anybody um, from the community can jump on our website, um, and, you know, in terms of the emails. If you go under schools or staff tools, the drop down, you'll see a staff directory um, that will be updated soon as we, you know, there's some new staff that are starting in the beginning of the year, but um, that's that's where our database of emails are. So if, if you're having trouble finding something on the website, you can always go there for emails. You know, I also want to remind everybody too, the reopening schools at midlakes.org email. We're also fielding um, questions. Um, and, 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 you know, kudos to, to the admin team here because you guys have been the ones responding um, to, to, the, to the questions. Um, any other advice, any other, any other, anything else that anybody else wants to add as we start begin to wrap up? You know, I would just say, I just want the community and our parents to know um, that we understand um, the burden that, that our plan places on them. And, and we wish, you know, that we're in circumstances where we could be more, aggr more aggressive. And, and we know we're being compared to other school districts. All we can do is, is deal with what we know our own resources and constraints are and that health and safety of our students and staff is what's driving our decisions. Um, we, we can't, I, I would never ask everybody to agree with our plan, but I hope that people at least understand that we're prioritizing the health and safety of our students and staff and all the decisions we're making. Um, again, we understand the role that we play um, for our community and that right now we're not fulfilling that entire role and that weighs heavily on every one of us. Um, but this is a health and safety um, endeavor first and, and then we fill in from there. We, we're gonna try as hard as we can to get kids back here as quickly as we can. Um, and we just ask for your patience, but continue to advocate. Um, we don't pretend to have all the answers and all the ideas. You know, there will be opportunities where we will reach out asking for feedback throughout the reopening process and throughout the school year, but don't wait for those surveys and opportunities. You know, as others have said, reach out to us, advocate for your child, challenge us, you know, push our thinking. Um, we, we will abide by the guidance um, to ensure the health and safety of everybody involved, 
but we are open to, to different ideas and, and, and we, will, we will consider everything as we should. Um, so we just ask your feedback and your patience. Frank, did you wanna add anything? Are you good? I'm good. I, I would just reiterate with both, both what Matt and Chris said is, you know, that we're, we're available all the time. Um, we're here um, for our students, for our community. Reach out if you have a question. Um, you know, it's, it's, this is new for everybody. You know, this is new for the community. This is new for the students. This is new for the staff. This is new for everybody. It's different. Um, I, I think everybody would agree that we're living in a society right now that doesn't look like what we're used to. Um, you know, so this is our new reality for now. Um, we are doing the best we can and we will continue to do the best that we can for our students. But if you have a question, reach out to us. We will answer to the best of our ability. Um, or if you have a concern, you know, the, the one thing that I, you know, I said in, in the spring to parents when they called me was, you know, if they had a concern about what was going on in the classroom, I would say, look, I, I'm used to being able, being able to walk around the building and walk into classrooms and, and see what's going on and hear it. And I, in a virtual environment, I can't do that. So I don't know what's going on. So you need to let me know what's going on if you have a concern about something. So that's what we're here for is, is to advocate for you and your students. Great, great. With that, um, we'll wrap it up. Um, I, I want people that have been watching us on Facebook, we've answered some of your questions, some of them we haven't gotten to. I'll collect some of those. We'll try to address it in one of the upcoming two uh, town hall meetings. We have another one tomorrow night, Wednesday at um, 6 p.m. And then we got one Thursday morning at 10 a.m. So you got that reopening schools at midlakes.org um, email that you can submit to your questions to. You can also reach out to, to administrators and staff um, through our website by searching for the staff directory. Um, and we'll continue to post more to social media, post more to our website. Um, we started an e-newsletter that we've been putting some highlights on, you know, pay attention to school board meetings too, because Mr. Sickles often has updates on the reopening plan with, uh, there as well. So, um, you know, we're open the, the floodgates up to communication, um, and, and, you know, we're, we're asking for it. So, so, uh, the message is bring it. Okay. So mm -hmm. once again, thank you to the panel. Um, for being a part. Mr. Sickles, looks like you got something on. I just want to point out, just to put in a plug for tomorrow night, we, we do expect each one, each of our town halls to be a little different and we'll hit different questions. We'll do some review as well, but we do have our school doctor scheduled to join us tomorrow at 6 p.m. Um, so probably lean a little bit more into some health and safety questions that may be of interest to people. Um, so just want you to be aware. Yeah. Want to give a little tease too because it's health and safety there's a unique fundraiser going on at secondary school i think it's the senior class um has something to do with face masks so um <laughs> i think we got our model trying one on look at that big m right there nice color so yep. um, those have been ordered and will be uh it is the senior class that will be selling them as a fundraiser and um, we have both uh small ch children's size and adult size Awesome. So I look forward to promoting that as well to our school community. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, remember next one tomorrow at six o'clock, uh, Facebook, Midlake Schools, Facebook and midlakes.org. Thank you very much and have a good day. Take care, everybody.